Thank you. So, can everyone hear me? Okay, good. I know this is probably not the most fun part of the workshop, so we'll try to make it short, brief, and direct. But we feel it's information that, as coaches, you need to know, not only in your role, but also to help your players. So today we'll be talking about match fixing and anti-doping, really looking at the practical information for coaches. So we'll look at the phenomenon, coaches' roles and responsibilities, coaches' intervention, substances and methods in ice hockey, coaches' advice. With respect to match fixing, we'll talk about what is manipulation of competitions, betting statistics, and what actions coaches can do to raise awareness and prevent match fixing. Okay, so doping the phenomenon. Is there an increase in doping or not an increase in doping in ice hockey? There is an increase, and there's specific reasons why we think that there is an increase. First of all, that's scientific development. Not only is there a development in the substances that are available, there's more substances in athletes, or not necessarily athletes, but people are finding greater ways to use them to help athletes, but also there's scientific development to prevent detection of the substances. First, second, there's salaries. Ice hockey salaries for players have become astronomical. Players want to attain these salaries and will look to any particular way to help them gain that advantage to get that higher salary. And also not only to get that higher, higher salary, but also maintain, keep in those particular positions or jobs that they have the higher salary. Second, or third, I'm sorry, demand in ice hockey. You guys all know, ice hockey players, our schedules are insane. Between international competition, maybe a European league, a domestic league, they have intense training schedules. They have intense game schedules. And they're always looking for a way, potentially, to speed recovery or help them on the ice. So we feel that this is leading to not a huge increase in doping, but definitely statistics that we can follow. So, with respect to coaches, we have the WADA code. I'm sure everyone knows who WADA is and everyone knows what the WADA code is. There are specific rules in the code that apply to coaches. That article is 21.2 and it says, coaches must be knowledgeable and comply with all policies and rules which are applicable to you or your players. You must cooperate with player testing programs. You must use your influence on player values and behavior to foster anti-doping attitudes. Okay, so the question is, I'm a lawyer and sometimes I don't even know what all of these rules mean. So let's summarize it. Question, what does this mean? You need to promote sportsmanship and related values. You need to be familiar with your league rules, your national federation rules, and the IHF anti-doping rules. No, you do not need to memorize every single rule. That's impossible. But you need to know the gist of the rules. You need to know where to go look if you think, oh, maybe that's a rule violation. You need to be familiar with the prohibited list. I'm sure everyone knows what the prohibited list is, but essentially it's the list where WADA writes down every single substance that a player is not allowed to take in competition. It's impossible for you guys to memorize everything on this list, but you need to know it exists, you need to know where to find it, and you need to know that if a player is taking something and you're aware of it, that either you or the player should check the list. You need to raise players' awareness of the use of medication, supplements, and street drugs. You need to be vigilant and intervene whenever you think a player may have broken the rules. It is a violation of the water code if you turn a blind eye. If you know your athletes are doping and you look the other way, you do not report and you do not step in, it is 2.9 of the water code and it's like complicity, like conspiracy, like you're involved in that and you can receive just as harsh suspension as your athletes. Further, whenever an athlete is found guilty of a violation, if it's a minor, the rules, the WADA code requires the anti-doping organization, the IHF, your NATO, investigates you as a coach, as athlete support personnel. You individually can be investigated and you can receive between a two and four year suspension from being involved in ice hockey. You need to ensure players are aware of the consequences for testing. In 2015, the sanctions increased players will receive a four-year suspension. That is career ending for a lot of players, most players. So what should a coach do if you suspect a player is using drugs? Talk to your player. Ensure that he understands the rules and the prohibited list. 
be involved. Just go up and start a conversation with him. Don't accuse him. Just ask him. Ask relevant questions. Let him know that you were there. Check to see if the violation that he may have done is deliberate or involuntary. If you find out that your athlete has went to the doctor and got medication, I mean, even myself, I know these rules, how can you punish a player who's sick and a doctor gives him medication? Just talk to your player. If he's taking medication for a valid reason, get a TUE. Take the appropriate steps so the player cannot be found guilty of a doping violation. Make sure the player is aware of the sporting values and the health. If he takes drugs, it affects the entire team. Make sure he understands that this is not just personal to him, it's to the entire team. He can, his, his actions can affect the entire team. Further, make sure your players are aware. There's no drug that is worth taking or is good for your body unless you have an illness, unless you have a reason to be taking that substance. And furthermore, a lot of the substances players can take have significant health detriment to them. And make it clear that you do not tolerate doping in sports. Make this a theme on your team, that doping does not, is not on my team. If you dope, you're not on my team. We do not allow cheaters. We do not allow doping. So the question becomes, in ice hockey, we had this year the 2017-18 season between the IHF and the leagues. This excludes the NHL, obviously, or non-member associations or non-member leagues of the National Federation. We had 31 cases. The cases involved cocaine, HC, HZTZ, amphetamine, um, I'm sorry, drostolone, cannabis, melodonium. These were just, there were obviously some cases with other substances, but these were just the primary substances that we had. So those kind of go down into three categories, stimulants, android, steroids, and marijuana. So a way that you guys can look to see, are my players taking or not taking prohibited substances, is look at the side effects that those substances um, produce in your players. So for example, stimulants, they're nervous, they're agitated, they might be aggressive, they might have insomnia or loss of weight um, and loss of appetite. For steroids, you see behavioral disorders, you see aggression, you see acne. In women, you'll see masculinization of the women. You'll see them create facial hair. For marijuana, you see forgetfulness, poor coordination, bronchial pulmonary disease. You can see addiction. I acknowledge with respect to marijuana that this does not help an ice hockey player play on the ice. And this is very true to the extent that IHF has spoken or even petitioned to WADA have this removed for ice hockey players. But the point is, it is on the list, and which means that your players, if it's caught in their system, will be found guilty of a doping violation. OK, supplements. I always feel like supplements is a real, real important topic with respect to doping. I think it's important to remember with supplements is the average player does not need a supplement. If he's in training intensely with a good nutritional diet, he can combat any effects or take advantage of any effects that a supplement may bring to him. However, there are some players that truly have a nutritional deficiency that they might need the supplement. And that your players should consult with doctors and make sure there's a relevant reason for them taking the nutritional supplements. Um, if used, supplements should be used with extreme caution. It has been shown that a lot of times supplements don't even stay in the body very long. They're excreted very fastly. Further, with protein supplements, the excess can be built up to fatty acid in the body especially creatine. This is creatine extremely um, dangerous for youth players and should not be used. And also you have to worry about supplement or questionable supplement purity. You think you get a supplement, you read the ingredients, oh, that's what's in the supplement. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Many of these supplements are created in a factory that's also, they also make a prohibited substance. And there's cross-contamination. And that's very, very difficult to prove. Also, supplement labeling. You get your supplement. You look at the package labeling. Well, none of those substances are on the prohibited list, so I'm free to take this. The problem is in the drug industry, a lot of supplements, ingredients, have synonyms. The IHF has had three cases just this year where a player, he did his due diligence. He read the ingredients. He checked every single ingredient with the prohibited list, but one of them was a synonym. The synonym was on the packaging, and he had absolutely no idea that what he was taking actually was a bad ingredient. So with respect to supplements, do not suggest the use of supplements. Generally, 
they're not needed. You should fight the physiological dependency. Alternative solutions can be crutches. A lot of players think that I can't survive. I can't, I can't play without this. I need this. It's almost a psychological thing rather than an actual physical thing. And make your players accountable for what they're taking. Also, it's important that these two organizations and their websites, they, there's a ton out there, but these are the two that the IHF recommends using. If your player wants to take a supplement, tell him to check it. Tell him to do his due diligence. They can go onto the site. They can check the supplement, supplement name. They can, they can check the batch number. And they do, they, these two websites provide a certificate that certifies that that particular supplement does not have any prohibited substances in it. Additionally, you can, and this is not talked about so much, the CAS, which is the Court of Arbitration for Sport, will look to determine the level of negligence in a player if he has been caught using a supplement or if he's been caught using a contaminated product. And they'll look at these five criteria to determine how much of, how significant the player's sanction is. So we recommend, IHF highly recommends that if your players want to use a supplement or they need to use something, that they go through these steps to ensure that the supplement is okay. So read the labeling of the product used or otherwise ascertain the ingredients. Make sure that you obtain the ingredients. A lot of times we have cases where a player says, oh, I was walking out of the ice hockey rink, the rink where we were playing at, and they have a sponsor, and their sponsor was handing out free packets, and they said to me, oh, this is 100% okay, this is 100% clean, you can take it. They take it one time and happen to have a doping test the next day. Or they go to, uh, I'm from the U.S., so I think of GNC instantly, they go to these nutritional stores, and you know, it's a salesperson, they want to sell the product, and they stand there and say, oh, no, no, it's absolutely fine, it's a great product, you can use it, it's not harmful to the body, and so they take it. Athletes need to check. They need to cross-check all of the ingredients on the label with a list of the printed substances. Make an internet search of the product. Ensure that the product is reliably sourced. Consult appropriate experts in these matters. Make your doctors, if you don't have a team doctor, make sure your players know there's somebody they can go to to talk to them about the substances they want to use. Help them, provide them the resources to ensure that they do not take prohibited substances. Okay, so generally, set an example. Do not trivialize the use of products that are fashionable amongst players. If you take it seriously, if you put that front forward, they will take it seriously. Ensure players understand that you will not tolerate drugs in your sport, on your team. Provide players with the necessary and accurate information. Make players accountable and be vigilant and intervene. Don't stand back and say, I didn't know, I wasn't aware. Don't turn a bland eye. Help them. Be involved. Be aware. Make foster an environment where your players feel comfortable coming to you if it's not you someone in your team, someone in your administration, someone where they can go to get the necessary help with respect to doping. Okay, now we will move on to the second topic. Sorry to switch gears so fast. And this is manipulation and ice hockey. Okay, so what makes ice hockey attractive to you? What do you expect when you watch an ice hockey game? What do you guys think? Why do you guys go to ice hockey games? Or why do you think fans come to watch your teams play? It's the on-ice competition. They go to see that, you know, that competition, that in the moment, heat, unpredictable, they don't know what's gonna happen. That's what they go to see. And what if the results were known in advance? What if there was no competition? That before the players even hit the ice, the result was already known. The result was already determined. Would you still want to watch that? In ice hockey, or all sports, there's two types of manipulations of competitions. There's one for sporting advantage and one for financial gain. Sporting advantage. What that means is I'm going to lose this game. I'm not going to play as well, not for money, but because this is a better route to get me to the, to the final. I can lose this team, and I will have to play less difficult teams to get to the final. That's match fixing. That's competition manipulation. You always have to encourage your players to pay, play the best. The second, the more obvious, is manipulating a game for financial gain. That's either through irregular betting or legal um, market, 
I'm sorry, irregular betting on the legal market. So you're betting in a country where it's completely legal or Ill illegal betting, such as in the United States. So there has been a significant increase in the manipulation of competitions. And there's a few key reasons why there's such an increase. It's globalization, developments in communication. 20 years ago, we didn't have the internet. 20 years ago, we didn't have cell phones. 20 years ago, we didn't have the technology that you could bet online. Developments in the betting market, being able to bet online, being the betting markets creating spot betting. You can, a game starts and they've offered not just the result, who will win or lose, they offer uh, fixes on who will score the first um, goal, who will make the first penalty, and they do this throughout the game. Also, organized crime, before there's an increased, it wasn't so much, but there's increased involvement in criminals in sports. There always was this idea that criminals wanted to be involved or associated with sport just because of the notoriety it brought to them. But now, they're being increasingly, increasingly more involved because they acknowledge the benefits or they acknowledge the opportunities is the right word. And failure of many authorities to do, any, to do the right thing. I think a perfect example is this. You have countries all over the world that are making and not making laws with respect to match fixing. A lot of them are being reactive. I think a perfect example of that is the United States right now. In the United States Supreme Court, they're making a decision about whether or not they're going to legalize betting. They're being reactive. They need to be proactive. Countries need to establish legislation. They need to establish specific rules. They need to penalize players. They need to penalize ple people who engage in max fixing. They need to be proactive. Cheating Sorry. in sport. Doping. Violent conduct. But what about losing on purpose to win money on a bet? or to face an easier opponent in the next round. This is called competition manipulation, or match fixing. It kills the competition, the excitement, the drama. It kills the motivation for clean athletes and fans. It kills the spirit of sport. Disrespecting your team. Disrespecting your opponents. Disrespecting your fans. You can make a difference. Don't fix, always do your best. Don't share inside information and always report. Okay, so that would give you guys a bit of idea about the three different types. With respect to match fixing, there's different levels. The first is obviously that the fixer deciding which games he's gonna fix. And then the second one is the approach. There's four different types of approaches that you guys could encounter. The direct approach, the indirect approach, becoming friends, and identifying weaknesses. The direct approach is quite easy. You'll have a fixer that comes up to you and he'll say, hey, I'll give you $10,000 if you don't play these, your three best players tonight. You're not going to win this game anyway, so just don't play them. No big deal. It's a win-win. You get the money, they sit out, no big deal. You weren't going to win anyway. The indirect approach. They're not always just gonna come up to you and say, why don't you help us out, give you some money? They're gonna go through your family, maybe your wife, maybe your kids, maybe your mom, maybe your dad. They'll become friends with you. This isn't a simple process where they approach you one day in the street and that's it. They foster it, they meet you, they become friends with you. It could be January 1st of 2018 when they meet you and May of 2019 before they actually ask you to do anything. You don't even realize what you're doing is something wrong. You're a good friend now. And they'll identify your weaknesses. Age, income, whether or not you have a problem, they'll blackmail you. They'll realize you need a significant surgery or a family member does. They'll offer to take care of it, offer to get your family member in the best hospital. And once you do it, once you do it one time, you play, don't play that player one time, because someone offered you a little bit of advantage. You're stuck, you're caught. Then they'll blackmail you. Because once you do it one time, you're guilty. I think it's kind of a good comparison to look between doping in sport and match fixing in sport. Both of them offer a hum like huge profits, huge profits. There's a difference though, mobility is limited in doping. The 
the person selling the drugs, he's within a specific geographical region. He can't be all over the world. Match fixers, they're in China. They're in completely different countries from the games they're actually fixing. What you need, you need a tangible product in doping. You need to be able to sell something to the athletes, sell something to the players. Whereas in match fixing, it's just a network. You don't have to have anything tangible. You deal with extremely violent criminals in doping, potentially. But in match fixing, it's the athletes, it's the referees, it's the officials, it's the bookies. The maximum penalty is very, very severe in doping. It's death. But in most countries, maybe a few years in prison, maybe a fine, the risk reward is very different in match fixing. There's not as big risk if you engage in this activity. Obviously extremely high, like I said, and low for match fixing. I think it's really important to note, I know you guys are all sitting there going, match fixing doesn't happen in ice hockey. It's really, it's really, it just doesn't occur. But the reality is the problem is huge. But we only know about a very, very, very small fraction of it because that's what's reported. This kind of gives you an idea of all of the countries in the world where a match fixing has occurred, reports have occurred. Only in gray are those countries that we don't have any information about. That doesn't mean that it's not occurring, not not occurring. It just means that we don't have the information on those countries. Worldwide, over one billion is bet on ice hockey every year. In the World Junior Championships, over 1 million euros is bet on ice hockey every year. In the world championships, 32 million is bet on our world championships every single year. In the Olympics, as you guys can see, this is percentage between the different sports. Ice hockey is the most bet on sports of the Olympics. And this is Pyeongchang. This is the most recent statistics we have from the Olympics. And these are the bets offered. So the, this one was how many people are actually betting. And this is the bookies. They're offering in blue is ice hockey. They're by far offering the most bets on ice hockey events in the Olympics. So the question is saying, like I said, is ice hockey, is betting match fixing really happening in ice hockey? Unfortunately, it is. Our first case was in 2014, where we had three players in the Danish league who bet for their team to lose. Very, very simple, not a big deal. They were doing it as a recreational activity. They did not think anything about it. Kirill Sturkov, which is one of the players that was engaged in this, um, this betting activity, he's actually a spokesperson now for the IHF. He's done a video for us, which we distribute to help inform other players about it. He did not realize. He just didn't know the rules. He did not know what he was doing was wrong. He did not realize he could not bet on ice hockey. And then the most recent case, is we had two, Euro, two Ukraine players in the World Championships Division I of 2017 that were caught for match fixing. In the Ukraine, they've received lifetime bans or indefinite bans. And in the IHF, they've received provisional suspensions. They're still under investigation because we're looking for further evidence on these cases. But these players, it will, they'll never live this down. This, um, one of the Ukraine players, he lost his contract. He didn't get to transfer. They'll never play for the national team again. Like, there's real consequences in these athletes for a very insignificant amount of money. And a lot of times they don't even realize what they're doing is wrong. <laughs> so it's very important to remember, match fixing jeopardizes the integrity of the competition. It damages the very soul of ice hockey. It damages the social, educational, and cultural values reflected in ice hockey. It jeopardizes the economic role of ice hockey. The problem is real, even though we only know, even though taking consideration how many games we have of ice hockey, most ice hockey games are clean. So, of course, we have regulations. The IOC, I'm sorry, the IHF has a code of conduct, where, which is where all of our rules with respect to match fixing are contained. These rules are applicable to players, they're applicable to coaches, they're applicable to anyone in your administrative staff. Also, all, most, not all, countries have national laws governing this, and then there's some conventions that are going on between countries with respect to match fixing. For ice hockey, what you guys need to know is don't bet on ice hockey, any ice hockey games. And if you're in a multi-sport event, 
You cannot bet on any other sport. So what that means, if you're at the Olympics and you're coaching at the Olympics or you're coaching at uh, FIZU, for example, the university games, you can not only not bet on ice hockey, you cannot bet on any of the other sports in that tournament. You should never manipulate competition and always encourage your players to do your best. If you're suspicious of a player at all engaging in any type of match fixing or any type of um, irregular conduct, you need to approach them, you need to talk to them, you need to ensure that they are not manipulating a game. Don't share insider information. Non-public information should not be shared. I can give you guys a very good example of this. I, when NHL players are released to come to the World Championships, I am the very first person that knows. This is before the IHF goes on the statistics. This is well before this information is given to the world or to anybody else. If I then put, oh, guess what? Guess who's coming to the championships on my Facebook page or on my Twitter? That would be sharing insider information, information that is not readily available to the public. You cannot do this. And report, as not reporting is wrong. If you're aware match fixing is going on and you do not report this, it is technically against the rules as well. And I think it's important for coaches to know this stuff because you guys are in the best position. You have contact with all of the players, adult athletes, children, young athletes. You have, you have contact with their entourage, sometimes their agents. You guys have contact with everybody. So it's good for you guys to know the rules that you, so that you can disseminate this information to the players. It's my job to make sure he does his personal best. What we know about her and the team stays between us. As a friend, I have information that could help to win a bet. And it could hurt him, his career, the whole sport. It's not worth it. Okay, you need to be aware of this topic and make sure that you know your league federation rules, your national federation, federation rules, and the IHF rules. Have your players attend workshops. The IHF gives integrity workshops at a lot of our championships. Make sure you encourage your players to go to these workshops so that they understand what exactly is match fixing. Also, we partner with IOC. The IOC has amazing tools online great e-learning tools that are short, direct, and to the point. It takes the athletes 10 minutes to do these e-learning, and then you don't have to worry about them inadvertently being engaged in these type of activities. And most important, be aware and be available. Just like doping, be there for your athletes or make sure that there's someone in your organization that is there for your athletes. Also, I think it's important for you guys to know and be aware that the IHF, in partnership with the IOC, we watch everything. Not only are we watching National Federation games and IHF competitions, but they are watching league games. Betting operators are doing this because they lose a ton of money when a game is fixed. So if a game is fixed in your league, the IHF will know about it. I get alerts all the time, 
all the time about a leak, very even down to low games, that the bet, because the betting operators do not want this. They are losing money, so they are fighting just as hard as we are to combat this. So we will know if it happens. Additionally, we're partnering with Sport Radar. For, so for our events, for the IHF championships, they watch every single event and give us reports that tell us how much bets are going on, if there is any regular betting. I get a report daily, every single day, for every single game at this World Championships. And lastly, like I said, you need, we have tools, like the IOC learning tool. The IHF also has tools. We have a really great video that goes to, we don't have time to go over it, but a really great video that Kirill, Kirill Starko from the Danish um, Association, the Danish player, he talks to the players about um, insider information, competition manipulation, betting. He goes through all of the um, different types and explains his story. He gives a personal perspective to athletes. This is available to all coaches anywhere in the world. It takes you five seconds, actually six minutes, before practice one day, show it to your players. Just make sure they're aware. We also have pamphlets. You guys can take these. You guys can put your logos on it. You can do whatever you want with them just to ensure that the message is getting out. Lastly, you need to be prepared. Have a person dealing with these matters concerning irregular betting within your organization. Know the facts and be up to date. Make sure you're aware of the rules and make sure you're aware when the rules change. Be aware of the various forms, insider information, competition manipulation, and betting on your sport. They're all wrong. You cannot do them. Know the possibilities of addressing the problem. Know who you can go to. You can go to your national federation. You can always come to the IHF. The IOC has a, an anonymous hotline. If you don't feel like you feel like you need to report this outside of ice hockey, if you feel like ice hockey is all corrupt and we're all involved, you, have a, you can report to the IOC and you can report anonymously. Know who to contact, and I think that the most important thing, and this is not only for match fixing, but also for doping, and I think I've made this a theme throughout this, you just need to be available. You need to foster an environment where your players feel comfortable coming to talk to you. If not you, make sure that they know that there's someone in your organization that they can come talk to about these topics. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you.